Quick note before the episode begins. On this new series of the Arzekwi podcast, we are going to be passing the mic over to some of our colleagues from our department so that they can share with you the interesting EU projects that we work on. But don't worry, Tima and I are not going away. We'll be back soon. Enjoy this episode. Welcome to Ars Equi, the podcast on all things law and technology. I'm Tima. And I'm Lucas. And welcome to another episode of the Pass the Mic series. So I'm back this episode because I am joined by my colleague Lucas and together we work on an EU Horizon 2020 project called the Food Safety Market or the FSM for short. Hi Lucas. Hi Tima, thank you for having me. Of course. So should we just dive in a little bit and tell them what the FSM is about and why they should care about this project? Yeah, sure. So uh, the Food Safety Market is a Horizon 2020 project, as you said, um, and it's all about food safety. So. Um, what the project is about, uh, we will try to build an open industrial virtual data platform um, where small and medium enterprises uh, can exchange food data, basically. Mm -hmm. And that should ensure that the quality and, uh, and the information um, on, on, on food processed in the European Union gets better. Yeah, I mean, I think what's so interesting about this project, like you said, is that it has to do with food safety. And I think oftentimes we don't really think about food safety like that. Like you go to the shops, you get your groceries, you go home, you cook, whatever. And no one, well, at least personally, before we started working on this project, I never stopped to think about the process that food goes through before it ends up on the shelves at the shops and how many actors are involved and how much data is produced as the process goes on. So it's really like interesting to be working on this. Yeah, absolutely. So one key takeaway would definitely be uh, that we just realized how many different people are involved there. Yeah. And um, that's a lot. And it's it's a, a definitely a huge process to get the information to everybody. Yeah, 100%. And I think what's very interesting and what's important to explain to the audience is that this project is really rooted in something that's a human right that I think a lot of us take for granted, which is the right to food. And the right to food is a human right that's established in international human rights law. And it's essentially an inclusive right, which means that we all have the right to nutritional elements that are necessary for us to live like a healthy and active life. And we all have the right to be have access to food that is safe for our consumption. And the FSM platform essentially plays a role in making sure that this right is truly realized and that the food safety process truly works smoothly and efficiently. Exactly, yeah. Right. Okay. So let's dive into a bit more of the technical aspects of the project, because I think that's maybe the part that might be interesting for, for some of the people who listen to us for the technical aspects that we discuss. Um, so the platform, yeah. So maybe Lucas, you can give us a little bit more info on the technical stuff. Yeah, sure. So um, the FSM came up with a mission um, they wanted to pursue. And um, our goal is just to develop a transparent data empowered certification ecosystem for a safe um, food supply chain. Um, and basically what the pr uh, partners are trying to do there, uh, we're trying to um, use the digital evolution that is going on right now mm. and um, building up a business ecosystem um, that not only supports uh, um, European food actors, but also um, from other countries outside of the European Union. I think we'll talk about that a little bit later. Mm. Um, and the basic idea is that not only the big um, food companies and the giants of the industry should get access to the data, um, but it should also be um, very easily accessible for small and medium enterprises. Yeah, and I think building on the idea that we're building a platform that's really for small to medium-sized enterprises is that we the platform is going to incorporate existing SMEs and existing SME platforms are going to essentially be infused together or work together to create this overall food safety marketplace for the EU. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it's really cool because it's nice when we are in like meetings and 
demos and stuff, we can already see platforms that exist and how they work and how everything is going to essentially work together when it's all combined to form the FSM or when it's developed further to form the FSM. Exactly. So it's really interesting to see how the one how the dot, dots are connected um, yeah. right now and how everything is um, going smoother and um, going to be uh, even even um, working more hand in hand together in the future. Yeah. So the first platform that is going to be a part of the FSM platform is already existing and it's called Foodakai. So Foodakai is essentially a food safety intelligence platform and it provides risk assessment and like predictive analytics services to its users. So essentially, Foodakai will provide users with like supplier evaluation so you can know which food suppliers are more susceptible to risk or which are better to go with. Um, they has functionalities like real-time incident monitoring and alerting and um, hazard analysis, automatic risk assessment and things like this. So it's really a platform that gives great insights into suppliers and what is going on in the supply chain. So yeah, so that's one of the platforms that's going to be developed more and additional functionalities will be added and then that will form part of the FSM platform. Exactly. Another um, platform or another application on the platform will be um, Agrivi 2.0. Um, that's basically farm management software where farmers can trace their crops, um, can plan cultivation, that everything goes smoothly hand in hand, mm -hmm. um, required field data. It basically is an application for the first step in the food supply chain mm -hmm. for the farmers. Um, yeah, also very interesting. Yeah, super interesting. And then the third and final application, which doesn't exist, and it's something that the project is going to be developing in addition, in additionally also developing all the other applications, but that's the food inspector application. And essentially it's an application for food inspectors or auditors, and they're able to use this application to perform their analysis um, of the audits and help them in the auditing process. So the application will allow inspectors to identify companies that need certification services. Um, it will help them prepare for audits, perform risk analysis, perform predictions on raw materials and ingredients, and it will also be um, an effective way for them to exchange data between auditors and the parties that are being audited. Yeah, so that's in a nutshell, very basic terms, not super technical, what the FSM is and what it will look like once the platform is fully developed. Right, so currently we are in the pilot and validation phase. Um, to give you a bigger context, uh, the project is going to last three years and it started back in January 2020. Um, so we're basically right in the middle um, of the project right now. And what we're doing um, is that we're testing all those applications we talked about um, in uh, so-called pilots. Um, pilots are basically just the testing phase um, mm. where we connect with actors and with uh, certain people in real life and try to make sure that the things we develop actually work and are applicable. Exactly. So um, I think what's so interesting in this project, which is different from all the other pilots that I've been a part of, is that it's going to be so big, right? So the pilots are really huge in the FSM and they are involving a lot of actors, a lot of different companies, and they're taking place in 10 different countries. So it's like a huge task that the consortium, which is all the partners that work on the project, are undertaking because it's just going to be such a It's, it's going to be a big task, in Absolutely. my opinion. Yeah. So the pilots are going to be in Greece, the Netherlands, where else? Um, Italy, Romania, Egypt, and Jordan, for yeah, example. Yeah, Croatia, yeah. Hungary, Poland, like it's an endless list of countries. <laughs> um, but it's an exciting pilot because it's going to involve so many different actors in the food safety supply chain. So we're going to have farmers, producers, um, members of certification bodies, food processors, all of these different people are going to come together and really test these applications and let us know if we're on the right track, if we are producing things that meet technical, legal, ethical, and even like the sectorial standards. So that's essentially what the whole process is about. Exactly. Yeah. And we don't do that not only once, but um, we're basically in a, in a constant trial and error loop where mm. we... Um, test feedback and to test um, applications which has already been reviewed by somebody and um, yeah, make sure that uh, we, we achieve the best outcome. Yeah. So 
like we've said, going into this phase, it's such a big thing that, of course, there's so a lot of legal questions that come up. And that's pretty much what we deal with. So we are the legal partners on this project, if that's already not been obvious. <laughs> and we have to basically make sure that everything in terms of the legal and the ethical aspects are all complied and are all going smoothly. And one big task of uh, our role as a legal partner is, for example, drafting the data management plan. So what the data, data management plan basically is, it is a data policy um, that is going to be applied in the pilot phase. Um, there are certain things outlined, for example, how the data is stored, how it gets processed, how long it is stored, who has access to, uh, to, to certain types of data. Yeah. Yeah. So essentially, that's what it is, what Lucas just said. It's just this big document that basically outlines all the things that we as the partners do in relation to data. And I think it's important to note that it also includes personal and non-personal data. So personal data, of course, being data that relates to an identifiable natural person. And then non-personal data in our case is all the food safety records and all the food safety related data. So yeah, so we outline the two and we basically let the consortium or the partners know what are the rules and requirements when it comes to managing data at the pilot sites. And then the next important thing that we have to deal with from a legal perspective is the question of consent. So when we go into the, the pilot phase, we have to make sure that all the people who participate basically give their consent, so give their thumbs up and say, yes, I want to take part in this pilot and I want to take part in all the different things that come with taking part in the pilot, right? Exactly, yeah. That's the ethical consent. That's the one side. And the other side is uh, consent in the sense of Article 7 GDPR, mm -hmm. uh, which is needed uh, that we have a legal basis for processing uh, everyone's, everyone's data. Yeah? Um, and in this consent form, there are certain things included, for example, which writes um, the, the data subject so the participant has, mm. for example. Um, yeah, and it's very important that we get all of this signed before the pilot phase starts. Yeah, exactly. So um, this is often something that's quite difficult to explain to um, partners to get them to understand that there's two different things happening here, right? So we have consent that is based in ethics, that's derived from ethical guidelines, and then we have consent that is based on the GDPR and that's derived from a regulation. And we always have to make sure that we don't conflate the two. So the ethical consent is just basically consent to participate and be involved in all the things that come with it. And the GDPR consent is consent to the processing of your personal information. So we always have to make sure that partners understand that two different things are happening here and that one consent cannot exist without the other consent. So yeah, so basically that's what we do with consent. Um, and then we also have to draft a bunch of different contractual agreements that the partners themselves have to sign. So yeah, so Lucas has been actually quite instrumental in the drafting because he's worked on data controllership agreements. We've done that together and we've also done data sharing data processing agreements together. So yeah, maybe just a little bit of information on what these different agreements are about and how we go about drafting them. Yeah, um, totally. There, basically, there is a big difference between personal data and non-personal data because when it comes to personal data, as you may know, um, we, uh, you subject has to comply with the GDPR. Mm. Um, and Article 26, for example, says that joint controllers um, uh, have to sign a joint controllership agreement when they jointly process, uh, when they jointly control certain types of, of data. Um, what they are saying basically in this document is that um, they are jointly responsible um, for the processing and they also determine which partner has which role in cases of a data breach, for example, or stuff like that. Yeah, so that's basically what it is, like a contract where controllers determine their rights and responsibilities and their roles and their roles in regard to the data subjects' rights and responsibilities. Um, perhaps we should define what a data controller is in case anybody doesn't know, but basically it's the person or the entity that determines the purpose and means of processing. So the people who determine, okay, this is the data that we're going to collect, this is the data that we're going to process, things like that. And in our case, it's the partners who are taking, leading the pilots that are basically determining what the purposes and the means of processing are going to be. So they are the ones who have to sign this agreement, which we draft. Um, and another agreement that deals with 
Personal data is the data processing agreement. Yeah. So uh, that agreement isn't between the controllers. It's between the controllers and the data processors. Mm -hmm. um, because sometimes controllers uh, do not have the means to uh, process data as they want. And they have to get into agreement with someone who can, uh, um, who uh, processes data on their behalf. And that's the, the, the data processor. Exactly. So basically, this contract is similar in some ways to the data controllership agreement because it basically regulates the relationship between the controller and the processor and it establishes you know the elements of data processing you know so what is the scope of processing what is the purpose what are the processes allowed to do and things like that it sets the parameters on which everyone has to agree on how data is going to be processed. So those are the two contracts that we draft that deal with personal data. Then we also draft a separate contract that deals with non-personal data, which is the multi-party data sharing agreement. And this is basically just an agreement between the parties who are all involved, so processors, controllers, but we don't use that terminology, but it's basically all the parties that are involved in the sharing of non-personal data. So this contract then determines how non-personal data is going to be shared, how it's going to be utilized, um, who retains control over that data, who doesn't, things like that, how long that data can be stored. All of these different elements are involved in the multi-party data sharing agreement. So it's a little bit confusing sometimes, but you have to just come from a place of distinguishing, number one, what type of data are we dealing with? And then that leads you into figuring out what the legal requirements are for whatever it is that you need to do with the pilots. Yes. So... The final legal question that we have to think about is data transfers. Um, and the big question for us was that we had to worry about data transfers outside of the EU, yeah? Exactly, because um, one of the or two, basically two countries uh, involved in our pilots um, are, non, are not member states of the European Union. That's Jordan and Egypt. Mm -hmm. um, and as you may know, transferring data outside of the EU um, can sometimes be quite difficult, yeah? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, a bunch of legal questions came up. In our case, uh, we don't have to worry that much because we do not transfer personal data from the European Union um, to one of these countries. We basically uh, process data of local businesses, of, um, of partners in these countries. Um, but on the other hand, um, so we, we, we don't have the problem that we transfer. Yeah, European so the data. transfer issue was kind of, we didn't have to deal with that, which was nice for us. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for Lucas and I, it was good that we didn't have to worry about that so much. Um, but there is also Article 3 in the GDPR, which basically says that an EU company or a company of an European member state has to comply with the GDPR, e um, even if the processing activity isn't inside the European Union. So if it's somewhere else. Yeah, exactly. So because of that article uh, 3.1, we then had to make sure that we explain to our partners that every processing activity that takes place in Jordan and in Egypt still has to comply with the GDPR. So they still have to make sure they get um, the informed consent of the participants. They still have to adhere to everything that we've stated in the data management plan. They still have to adhere to the um, roles and responsibilities outlined in, all, in the agreements that we previously discussed. So all of those things are still applicable. So we had to let them know that you can't just now go rogue because you're going to be in Jordan or Egypt. You have to still comply with the GDPR and you also have to comply with the laws in Jordan and Egypt that deal with um, the exchange of personal data and the processing of personal data. So yeah, so those were the, the real things that we had to deal with. And for Lucas and I, it's been, it's been cool. We've been working together now for how many months? I think it's our... Uh for three months already three right? months yeah. and we've done a lot exactly yeah. <laughs> um, and it's been interesting to kind of work on such a such an innovative project and such a different project because I don't think we don't even we don't have another project like this at the department yeah I think the food sector is, is pretty interesting and we're um, yeah, definitely something unique what we're doing here. Yeah. So um, thank you all for listening. We hope you have enjoyed this episode. And if you want to find out more information about the FSM or the food safety market or, all, or any of the Horizon 2020 projects that we work on at the department, all the links are going to be in the description bar. And thanks for coming, Lucas. Thank you very much, Tima. Bye. Bye.